Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends. Welcome to the IPFW School of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Lecturer Series. For those of you who do not know, I'm Mark Lippmann. I'm the dean of the school. Welcome. As does any great university, IPFW provides a wealth of educational and cultural benefits to the community we live in. This lecture series, sponsored by the school and begun in 1982, highlights the breadth that comprises the arts and sciences, as you can see by looking at the titles of previous lectures in your program. We do this twice a year. Sometimes uh, we bring in outstanding external speakers. Tonight we have a scholar from our very own faculty. Frank D. Palladino is the Jack W. Schreie Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Biology. His research is focused on the physiology, ecology, migration, and conservation of marine turtles for the last 20 years. With the help of over 45 students, he's published 50-plus journal articles and obtained over $2 million in external research grants. He's been elected a fellow of the AAAS, Sigma Xi, Phi Kappa Phi, Tri Beta, Scientific Honor Societies, and the Explorers Club. He was awarded an honorary fellow of the Royal Geographic Society in London and appointed as a caballero of the Costa Rica National Parks System. He was selected in 2001 as the Researcher of the Year by the Indiana Academy of Science and Distinguished Lecturer at Indiana University Richmond in 2002. His research has been profiled in two National Geographic specials, one PBS series entitled The Dinosaurs, on the Today Show, and as the focus of a month-long interactive expedition on the Discovery Channel entitled Love and Death on Turtle Beach. He's developed, along with the Scholastic Network and the Fort Wayne Children's Zoo, an interactive marine turtle conservation and science program that has been used by over 8 million children worldwide as part of grades 3 through 12 science curriculum. His research is highlighted by three articles in Nature, the world's most cited international journal of science, focusing on heat regulation and metabolism in giant leatherback sea turtles. He's worked on the species' long-distance migration patterns and a population model based on 15 years of demographic and nesting data. As a consequence of this work, in February 2002, he was one of the principal scientists to call on the United Nations to request a moratorium on longline fishing. His work has provided insights into the effects of El Nino and the impact of human influences on sea turtles. His work formed the scientific basis for the establishment of a new national park in Costa Rica, Parque Marino Las Balas. Ladies and gentlemen, life, death, and extinction on Turtle Beach. Professor Frank B. Palladino. That's to reduce the, <clears throat> the glare off the top of my head. Uh, part of the death and extinction will probably be the death and extinction of me, but I, I've always hesitate to give a speech before any audience without first acknowledging the fact that I really thrive on the labors of all the students and colleagues who've worked with me. Um, it is not a, an individual effort. All this work that has been compiled over the last 20 years, and there are just too many people to mention. I also want to say that I'm very honored. IPFW has become, in my opinion, one of the premier state universities in the Midwest, and we should be very proud of the fact that we have an excellent faculty. When I first came here, there was really very, uh, I would say, very limited ability to do research, but we have maintained the excellence in teaching that we always had and have now enriched the faculty, the Fort Wayne area, as well as the United States and the world with, I think, a world-class group of researchers, and I'm just very proud to be one of them, and thank you for this honor. Uh, <clears throat> I've been working for a number of years, but this past year uh, received a significant amount of money from the top program. This is a $20 million gift from the Sloan and the Packard Foundation, which is uh, initiating what's called the Galapagos Cocos Marine Conservation Seascape and Initiative, which was an outgrowth of a 1996 paper that my colleagues and I published in Nature, in which we noticed that the ocean bathymetry was very important and crucial 
to the migratory pathway of turtles as well as the commercial fisheries that were being found on these same pathways. This conservation effort includes a very strong scientific component of which I'm only a part. They're tagging Pacific pelagics, meaning all the large organisms that wander throughout the ocean. And I'm going to take off my jacket because it's not what I'm used to doing when I'm in Costa Rica. And uh, the fact is that they are now tagging sharks. They're tagging, tagging uh, rays. They're tagging uh, all kinds of seabirds that roam the oceans in the Pacific to get a better handle on what part of the ocean they use, why they go there, and why we see these animals aggregating in the same places at the same time. They're not using the exact same resources, but there are very similar structure to what they are doing in the ocean. And so this is a first attempt to try to understand that vast amount of blue that's on all the maps and globes that we've all stared at. And the Pacific is one of the least known of those areas. Again, for those of you who are of the geographic illiterate, to let you know, Costa Rica, where I spend most of my time, is located in Central America. Central America is that stock of land that sits below Mexico. And I put this up there because National Geographic has given me lots of money and they say I'm supposed to make you all geographically literate. Costa Rica is a state, a country about the size of the state of Massachusetts. It's sandwiched in between Panama and Nicaragua. You have the Panama Canal that all of us know about that's right here. And I work primarily on the Pacific coast, but I have also worked on the Caribbean coast as well, as you will see in some of the works. Now, Costa Rica is a very progressive country in that over the last 20 years, they have created a national park system, which is the envy of the world. In the United States, we have less than 1% of the total land mass is set aside as national parks and wildlife preserves. In Costa Rica, they have 21% of their land mass set aside. This is a huge amount of their resource that is now put aside to conserve nature and biodiversity. That includes rainforest, it includes cloud forest, it includes coastal areas, it includes mangrove estuaries. So the Costa Rican government has planned ahead and that's why they have become a mecca for ecotourism. The mustard colored areas here are all national parks. And the newest of them was created in 1994, and that's Parques, Parque Marino Las Baulas, where we work. I work with sea turtles. I actually started out and got my PhD as an avian physiologist, but I was very fascinated by reptiles, especially large reptiles. And I initially started working with alligators, but they bit, and they were pretty nasty. So, a colleague of mine suggested that I switch to sea turtles, and I haven't regretted the move since then. The largest of the sea turtles is the leatherback. This animal is about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, and it has been in the same form that you see it up on this screen for about 20 million years. You can find fossil records of dermochelids that look exactly like this, some of them a little larger, back in the fossil record 20 million years. And the dermochelid line is 65 million years old. So they have very close relatives that have been on existence on this planet for over 65 million years. Unlike humans in which we are probably only a couple of hundred thousand years old and our lineage maybe goes back three to four million years. So this is a very ancient animal that has lived in the ocean and has not changed very much. One of the reasons we suspect it hasn't changed more very much is because it occupies a niche in the ocean which is not occupied by anybody else. There are seven species of sea turtles. Uh, the green sea turtle is a herbivore eating turtle grass and we find the other sea turtles also occupy different niches in the ocean environment and are very close in some instances to the size of a leatherback 
but for the most part, the leatherback is two to three times as big as all the other sea turtles. There are 28 known beaches around the world in which there are significant numbers of leatherbacks to have nested. Of those 28 beaches, all of them, absolutely all of them are declining. And the decline has only come in the last 20 to 25 years. These animals had a population estimated to be somewhere around uh, 90,000 individual females reproducing on the beaches that rim the Pacific. That was an estimate that was made from beach surveys that was done in 1980. That's 23 years ago. The estimate that we have now in 2003 is about 1,500 turtles. So this decline has been precipitous to the point where we are now very concerned about the extinction of these animals. And they have been, because of a submission we sent to the IUCN, now red listed, meaning that they are critically endangered and a very big uproar has come up in the Pacific to try to protect these animals. The situation in the Atlantic is not as severe. There are still a couple of tens of thousands of these turtles in the Atlantic, but the fact is in the Pacific they have declined precipitously. Where I have studied is a complex of beaches located on the Pacific coast of Guanacaste Province, Costa Rica. The three complex of beaches include Playa Ventanas, Playa Grande, and Playa Langosta. In between is sandwiched another beach which used to have a significant turtle population, but which now has a, when I started in 1988-89, had a population of about 110 people. The population now is close to 10,000 with a Best Western and any number of other hotels and resorts in that area. Dramatic growth in that period of time. Here's a picture taken from an ultralight of the beach. The turtles nest on these beaches in Costa Rica from October 1st through till the end of February in significant numbers, with the peak of the season being in January. The fact is that it's a tough job, but somebody has to go down between October and February and work in this tropical environment, and I think it's gl I'm glad that it's me, because this is an ideal, pristine, and beautiful place. There are now a smattering of maybe five or six houses along this beach, which is Playa Ventanas, this area is almost completely developed. You can see when I took this photograph in 1994, there's only about four houses. There's now about five, five more houses in this area. And luckily, this central area has not been developed. And that is where most of the turtle nesting has been moved to. When we first started, there was an equal number of turtles nesting all the way down on both these beaches. This Playa Grande beach is a little bit more than 3.4 kilometers in length. So you have in the evening a three and a half kilometer beach at which time there used to be a hundred sea turtles that would come out and lay their nests on the beach. Because these are reptiles, their eggs must be incubated on land, and this is where they do it. The leatherback is the largest of the sea turtles and the largest of all turtles that are known. It gets as much as 900 kilograms, and for those of you who are not metrically literate, it's 2.2 pounds per kilogram. So you've got one ton of turtle that can come out on the beach each night. They can get as long as three meters long from the tip of their snout to the end of their shell. And when their flippers are extended across can be as much as four to five meters. So these animals are swimming machines. They're very stream streamlined. They're one of the widest ranging vertebrates in that they're found north of the Arctic Circle and all the way down to the southern polar regions. They <clears throat> like fish, whales, deer, wolves, and fish have a backbone. They're vertebrates, 
and they must breathe air. So unlike fish, they have to come to the surface to periodically breathe. They travel from Siberia to New Zealand, Labrador to Norway, and all the way down around the tip of South Africa. The deepest diving animal of the ocean in that it's been shown by us to go deeper than a thousand meters. That's an impressive dive for an animal that's holding its breath to do. This is similar to some of the deepest diving whales. It's an international treasure in that it has a skin like a dolphin. It's actually very smooth and oily. Its streamlined shell has very tiny bones and cartilage very similar to that of a shark. And it is able to control its body temperature in warm as well as in cold water. It maintains a very constant body temperature, which is impressive, especially in the fact that these animals are found north of the Arctic Circle in water that you or I would freeze to death to in less than seven minutes. On Earth for over 60 million years is Dermochelids and probably in the same form as Dermochelid Coracio as we have here for 20 million. And they are very severely threatened with extinction only in our lifetime, within the last 25 years. So is the leatherback going extinct? Do we have a situation where an animal is disappearing? Well, here's the data that we've collected since 1988, which shows the precipitous decline. Now, we did know that turtles and marine populations tend to fluctuate with respect to their reproductive activities. You can see here on this figure that, that the peak, when we first started there, there was almost 1,400 individual females that would come and nest each year. And you can see that then all of a sudden there was a precipitous drop. These drops in reproductive numbers have been shown to be cyclic and is evidenced in other sea turtles as well as other marines, vertebrates. But you can see then there was a recovery. Then another very severe drop to only 180 individuals with again a recovery. And this cycle of about every two to three years a precipitous, precipitous drop. But what you notice is you never recover back to the 13 to 1,400 individual turtles that were there when we started. Where are these turtles going? Are they going someplace else to nest? Or are they disappearing? This was one of the big questions we had. And when we first started seeing these numbers, we uh, were not too worried because we felt that there were these cyclic events in reproduction. We also knew that there were impacts of global climate features like El Nino. In El Nino, there's a global warming of the ocean surface waters, which has been shown to affect the available nutrition. So what we were very interested in finding out is, were these periodic declines due to El Nino effects? And if so, was it during the El Nino year? Or was it in the subsequent nesting season? Or maybe two nesting seasons down the road? Because we know these animals are out in the ocean pelagically harvesting the food they need to live, as well as the resources in that food to then produce their eggs and return and reproduce. So these are some of the questions we were asking. This was the 2001-2002 season. There were only 69 individuals. And I will tell you this year, which we just completed, the data indicates that there was only 59 individuals. Is that right, Nathan? We didn't get any more after we left, right? I think one more. Okay. So there were 60 individuals this year. What's the problem? Where is it coming from? And where are these guys going? Well, the fact is that fishing practices in the late, mid to late 80s changed dramatically in the Pacific. We were very effective as conservation groups to change everybody from eating tuna that was caught in purse seines. Purse seining tuna was outlawed. And what happened was there was an explosion of long line fishing, which would had been very small in impact and really only targeting swordfish at the time. 
Now long lining was, became the substitute for tuna fishing. This is even worse than purse seining. I'm sorry to say, a few dolphins who were getting knocked off, it's now the entire biodiversity of the ocean. These hooks are indiscriminate and they're sitting out there by the millions. They're catching everything whether by accident or by design, with only a very small portion of it, two to five percent, which is the harvestable product which can be sold. So long line fishing, which you see here, these are the Taiwani boats that are at Punta Arenas. I took this picture about uh, two years ago. They put out miles and miles of these hooks, which as you can see, turtles will bite on, run into, get entangled in. And you can see here's a leatherback. This is a mahi-mahi fishing boat in which we gave the guy a camera, a video camera to take these pictures as well as a still camera, in which they continually said, oh no, we don't catch any turtles. On this one run, there are seven turtles that are leatherbacks that were shown to have been caught. Mahi-mahi is a dolphin fish which most of us like to go and eat at Red Lobster. And this is right off the Cocos Ridge by the Galapagos Islands. We also know that the shrimp fishery, we all like to eat shrimp, has had a very dramatic impact on marine life as well. In the United States, there is now a law. It's called the Turtle Excluder Device Law, which all vessels that are registered in the United States and who are fishing in United States waters must put a large barbecue grid about the size of about 10 feet across in the middle of the purse in which the shrimp are caught. This allows for turtles and all large marine organisms that bump into it to escape out through a trap door. This does not reduce the shrimp catch, but it protects the marine biodiversity. This law was passed by the Clinton administration. Actually, it was signed by George Bush Sr. 15 minutes before he left office to prevent the, Bush, uh, the, the Clinton administration from doing that. It had passed Congress for nine years prior to that during the Reagan administration, I should say, eight years. And it wasn't until Bush was ready to leave office that he signed it into effect. And I don't know if you guys know how hard it is to get a law passed through Congress, but it's not an easy trail to get both the Senate and the House to agree on anything, especially anything that has to do with conservation. And the fact is that it is now a law, but is being challenged by the new Bush administration. This is a law of the land, just as if, you, you know, when you murder someone, there are federal statutes. The Bush administration, by policy, has now tried to change that. You cannot change law by policy. We have one on appeal. The policy was that they want to allow the importation of shrimp from India, Malaysia, Vietnam, who do not use TEDs. This would be as if we would allow the importation of FDA-approved drugs that are produced in Malaysia, but in factories that do not come up to the standards that we have for production. The case is now before the Supreme Court, and I am the principal signatory, or sui, against the Bush administration. So if I should disappear, please, <laughs> please note that I'm probably in a Republican trunk somewhere. But we have won all our appeals all the way up to the federal court, where there is now a federal appointee of George Bush Sr., who is reviewing the case before it goes to the Supreme Court. Our belief is that he will, re he will be the first individual to say that the law of the land can be changed by presidential policy. We certainly hope that the Supreme Court will not do that because it will set a precedent that I think all of us will not like to have. Leatherback turtle eggs on the beach where we were have been poached for 20 years prior to our presence in 1988. When I say poached, what they did was they harvested the eggs. 
just like we went into the chicken coop and harvest the chicken eggs, they would take a bag and as the turtle lays his eggs, they would collect those eggs. And here are the eggs here, they're about 60 to 70 of them laid per clutch. And they're about the size of a billiard ball. And they incubate in the sand for approximately 60 days, at which time they hatch and emerge out from a nest which is down about 30 centimeters from the surface of the sand. The animal comes out of the water and digs very ritualistically a hole. And I will tell you the first time I saw this, I was very impressed. It was like a dinosaur coming out of the ocean, digging a hole in the ground and then burying a bunch of eggs and going back. It was impressive and if I invite all of you who are here to please come down anytime between October and, and February and visit us. And a lot of you have come. And I will tell you it is an experience that you and your children will not forget. It is very, very awe-inspiring and it is something that has been going on for 65 million years in the same exact way. And after about, oh, I, and these happen to be all of Ridley's for my students in the audience who are sitting there going saying, those aren't leatherbacks. These are all of Ridley's, another sea turtle that lays its eggs on this beach as well. They dig up through the sand and then they run towards the sea, never to be seen again unless they're a female who comes back maybe 15 to 20 years later to reproduce herself. So they spend the rest of their entire life in the ocean and it's only for this brief period of time as eggs and as hatchlings that emerge from the sand that we find them coming onto land. These are the way they used to poach. They'd ride up and down the beach, find a turtle, jump off their horse. He's got a bag there and he looks like Omar Sharif there. <clears throat> Here's a survey of the longline fishing effort in the Pacific Ocean. All those red dots are very concentrated areas of fishing pressure. There's not much of the Pacific left for anybody but fishermen. The yellow area is the uh, longline fishing out of Hawaii, that's based out of Hawaii, which about 20 colleagues of, and myself closed because the United States has an endangered species law which says that if there is anybody doing anything in business that hurts an endangered species, they have to cease and desist. So for the last four years, the long line fishing based out of Hawaii has been closed down. But you can see that that was a very minimal impact and that yellow has now been taken over by red, which is basically the Taiwanese and Chinese fishing effort. Some of the other impacts on these animals as to why they're declining is the construction of these huge mansions along the beach as well as hotels. You know it's not a problem that they build them it's just that they got to cut all the vegetation out in front so that they can see the beach see the sunset if they left the vegetation that was naturally there in front it would not be a problem because it would obscure the lights and activity in, in the evening of the house. This, by the way, is National Park property. The National Park was declared only up to 15 meters from the high tide zone. So the land behind that was private and could be bought and sold and built on. These folks have all illegally cut all the vegetation and replaced it with stupid palm trees that don't do anything. This type of activity is what has caused an impact on the nesting in those areas, including 1,000 unit hotels, which have an occupancy of maybe 1% over the entire year. And the accumulation, of course, of human waste and garbage, which attracts predators which never used to be there before. Dogs, raccoons, skunks, coatis, which occasionally would be there, are now there year round, having an impact on the animals. This is Playa Grande. This shows you where the houses are and hotels on the both extremes of the beach. And what you will notice is in those areas, 
there's very little turtle nesting. This used to be a real hot spot. This was a great place to see a leatherback nest. Now, I don't believe there was more than two turtles that nested there the entire year. And the fact is that down at this end, the same thing is happening. And you can see most of the nests are being found in this central empty area, which has not been developed yet, but which is slated for development. As a matter of fact, the people who are, have that property like to play the little game. They, they, this is what the natural vegetation looks like. But when somebody's coming to see the property, they cut all the underbrush out and burn it around the trunks of the large trees, which they're not allowed to cut. On private property in Costa Rica, you're not allowed to cut down a tree that has a diameter of greater than six centimeters. But if you burn it by accident and it's dead, then you can cut it down because it becomes a hazard. So you're constantly battling in this area, there's also a very shallow aquifer. The fact is that the water, the fresh water available, has not been fully utilized, but there's very little of it. Now, with all this development, they are at capacity. Anybody who's lived along a marine shoreline knows that once you drain down the freshwater aquifer, it becomes infiltrated with marine salt water that now can push into the underground areas where this freshwater aquifer used to be. The local farmers are enraged because these large hotel complexes have been using huge amounts of water for their golf course that's attached. That has dropped the aquifer down so that their shallow, their shallow wells are no longer capable of reaching where the water is and you need very expensive drilling equipment to get down to the next aquifer. Or you need to pump in water from aquifers that are miles away. This is a real problem, and you can see here if anybody speaks Spanish in the audience, they want to defend their water. They're really angry. The Guanacastecos is the, listen, this is the state. It's like, listen, Hoosiers, they're robbing our water. That's a say, Roban Nuestras Agua. They're robbing our water, those gringo developers. And they're very, very angry about this because they no longer have the resources or money to protect it. What has Costa Rica done? Well, I'm very pleased to say that they're actually doing something. What they're doing is, I think, the best they can. They volunteered to serve as the new home for the Secretariat of the Inter-American Convention for the Conservation and Management of Sea Turtles. This is an important first step because now this is going to create treaties between countries that are lining the Pacific Rim and allow them to protect sea turtles by cooperative effort. They have introduced a new law to expand and consolidate Parque Marino Las Balas so that it's now going to be 1.2 kilometers from the high tide zone. There's a lot of private land in there. A lot of it is prime real estate, very, very expensive. Anybody here a billionaire and want to give me money, let me know. Because right now, Conservation International is going to give us $4.5 million dollars and all that's going to buy us is some of the open areas, areas that do not have houses on it. And we have a donor who is also giving us a million dollars. So together with this resource of money, we are going to start and initiate the process of expropriating land, which I'm sure all of you are aware is a very lengthy process Costa Rica has just as many lawyers behind the trees as we have in this country, and it's going to be a long legal battle. But I think most of the people who own the open areas are going to be willing to sell because we're offering them prices slightly higher than what they would get when the government expropriates it. Also, the minister 
and the president announced that they will not approve development permits for any critical areas on Turtle Beaches. So these open areas that do not have housing on them will be protected. Is that in English what I wrote there? Oh, yeah, it's publicly announced this administration will not approve development permits on Turtle Beaches. And as a matter of fact, this is the minister right here at our beach making his announcement at a turtle festival that we had. Uh, this is him sitting at a dinner, and these are the park personnel who's worked with us and people from U.S. Fish and Wildlife who are now also very concerned. Let me get to my research. Besides the conservation research that you see now, what have we learned? Well, leatherback turtle physiology is very unique and very interesting. It includes features like TSD, temperature dependent sex determination, in which when an egg is laid and placed in the sand, it has the ability to become either a male or a female hatchling, depending on the temperature at which the egg is incubated. This is a very interesting phenomena in which there's a temperature sensitive gene that triggers the cascade of events that produce the male or female reproductive structures in the, in the, in the hatchling as it's developing in the egg. This is a fairly primitive mechanism, one that we believe was in an ancient reptilian line that we also see in crocodilians, which are in the archosaurian and very ancient lineage, and we suspect may have been also found in dinosaurs and some of those other older reptilian lineages. We also find that they exhibit and have a trait known as gigantothermy, uh, a subject of one of our other nature papers in which these animals, because of their large size, are capable of thermal regulating, keeping their body temperature constant, despite the fact that they're exposed to very warm oceanic temperatures in the tropics and very cold temperatures when they go down very deep, as well as when they're in the northern regions. Leatherbacks are in decline and in, in danger of extinction, especially in the Pacific, and so on. Now, the satellite tracking of their migrations has been one of the more interesting aspects of what we have discovered and learned. And I'll get to that in a minute. It's just that I'd like you all to know a little bit more about TSD. In this case, this is a plot which shows the results of hundreds of hatchlings that have been incubated in very finitely controlled thermal incubators, styrofoam boxes that are kept. If you incubate them at 27, 28, 28.5, 100% of these become male. See, there's 0% female. So when they hatch out of the egg and they emerge, these are all males. Right at around 29, 29.5, all of a sudden you start seeing female hatchlings emerging. And very quickly then, above 30 degrees, 100% of the hatchlings that emerge are females. So there's a temperature sensitive gene that is triggered by the incubation temperature during a critical period. It's the middle trimester, the second trimester of incubation which causes the cascading events that determine whether they are male or female. Now, the migration of these animals was difficult to understand. We would tag them and never see them again, and then they'd show back up on the beach three years later. Where do they go in the ocean? What do they do? We didn't know. The only way to really get a handle on these marine pelagics is to put a satellite transmitter on them. We worked with a company called Telonix in Arizona to develop a platform that would work in a marine environment. They were working with us and some people who are working with whales in the late 1980s. And we used the only commercially available satellite, the Argos system. 
which has these satellites that orbit, and this is the track of the NOAA 10 Argos satellite. These are also the same satellites from which your television station pulls down the weather maps and the cloud cover from. We would send a signal up to this satellite with, which would pass over, you can see here's the window of its, of its uh, site. And we would send a signal up via a satellite transmitter that was attached to the turtle. And every time the turtle came up to breathe, it would break the water and the antenna would stick up out of the water and it would turn on the mechanism to send a signal. And all I needed was three one hundredths of a second for that signal to be sent up to the satellite and stored, which would then be sent to me at my computer right here in Fort Wayne. We attach these via a small hole drilled into the posterior portion of the pygle process on these turtles, in which we then had a corrosible swivel. You can see here the satellite technology is such now that they're about the size of a small Cuban cigar. You can see it doesn't really have much of an impact on the animal. Here's the turtle and two cool guys sitting there. This is my colleague Steve Morreale at Cornell University, did his PhD working with us down there. This is the kind of data you get. Where do they go? What we found is that they're nesting here in Costa Rica and as they traverse out, they're following right along this ridge this mountain ridge that extends out from Costa Rica all the way out to the Galapagos Islands. We were very surprised because if you read the encyclopedia descriptions, these animals were pelagic wanderers. They wandered the ocean. To me, the word wander means you don't have any real rhyme or reason as to where you're going. These animals were very directed. They have 180 degrees to choose from and they're all going out exactly the same route along the same line and in a period of four years we tracked 12 turtles going out year after year after year through a very narrow corridor just like the flyways that you find for birds and we Describe this as a migratory corridor, a biological corridor of great importance. And it just happens to also be one of the biggest areas for longline fishing right across the Galapagos. So these turtles, although they're not targeted by longliners and they don't want to catch them, they're being caught by accident as they go through this gauntlet that sits there off the Galapagos Islands. Here's some more data that shows that some of the other turtles that have been tagged up in Mexico come out and also come right down in through the same corridor as our turtles from Costa Rica. And there are turtles that are found not nesting but eating jellyfish off the coast of Monterey, California, which we have now tagged and which go across and nest over here in Malaysia. In this area is where they come to feed and they migrate across to this area to nest. So they're very directed movements and you can find that these areas are collecting points also for many other migratory species. We found three different corridors for the movements of these animals from Costa Rica, two of them in the Caribbean, one going north and around out into the um, into the Atlantic, the other one going across the Caribbean this way from Panama. The Cocos Initiative, which we are now working together with Conservation International, has a very interesting point in that there are a number of very strategically placed islands that are sitting out here which extend the exclusive boundaries of countries lining this area out quite significantly. These islands, including the Galapagos, the Cocos, Coiba, Gorgona, 
and Malpelo Islands extend the boundaries of Ecuador, Colombia, Panama, and Costa Rica out as far as this red area. That means they will be able to control fishing in that area because it is their waters. It is not international waters. And we are hoping that the Oceans Committee from this Congress will give sufficient funds to allow for enforcement of laws that we are now wa working to pass that would be international agreements between these four countries to control and regulate the fishing in this area. As you can see from this map, there's an awful lot of structure. This is the Cocos Ridge, which they're following. Now, this mountain chain is more than 1,000 meters below the surface, yet it is influencing and part of the dynamics of the movement of these animals through the ocean. And you can see here that they are also showing the other islands, Coiba, Cocos, Malpelo, and the Galapagos Islands are located along this ridge. So this structure certainly we know is now important in influencing the movements and migrations of leatherbacks, but probably also fish, which are the target species for many of these fishermen out there. We're now in the process of using other technology to identify where these animals are going. This is a special tag designed by a company up in Canada, Lotech. It's an LTD tag, light temperature and depth tag, which gives me location by the light intensity at dawn and dusk, which is sensed by this little light stalk. It has also allowed us to better define what parts of the ocean column these animals are using. You can see it's very unobtrusive on the animal, attached over here on the side, very small, no real great impact on the animal, yet it gives me some really fascinating data. You can see here that this animal was diving, and you can see each one of these green swatches is a dive. This one was down to as far as 200 meters. Some of these dives have been quite dramatic. When you put the dive, the temperature, and here's the light. So we know the duration and the time of light. So you can see this is day one, day two, day three, day four, and so on down the line. You can see that this animal was diving, and as it went deep into the water column, it also dropped in temperature from a surface temperature of around 27 down to the temperatures below 15. So these animals are occupying different aspects of the water column, and we are going to now be able to start to understand better what parts of the ocean environment they're actually using. This is a fairly spectacular dive in one individual that went out, oh, you can't see it, well, at least I can't, but I can see it over here, it's real nice. <laughs> The turtle has those spotlights and the shine off the top of my head. The fact is that this animal went down 540 meters. That's a fantastic dive. And down to water temperatures of 7 to 8 degrees centigrade. The dive itself took 54 minutes. So this animal is holding its breath for quite a spectacular long period of time. This is impressive. I think you can see it here. Here's actually the dive. You can see over here, this says 500, by the way. So that's about 540 at the bottom. And you see they come up just like whales do. They sound. They come straight up, breaking through, taking a breath just like a whale does. Here's some of the satellite imagery of where the turtles are during the inner nesting period. Here's our nesting beach. They all tend to go up in this northern area, which is the Gulf of Papagayo, and hang out. And we're going to be able to better identify and define what parts of the ocean they use. There are other turtles that we've worked with on the Atlantic coast. With my colleague Steve Morreale, we've tracked loggerhead hatchlings, uh, I should say juveniles, that come in along the estuarine bays from Connecticut all the way down to North Carolina, and then they go out 
along this ridge out here. And the question is, why are they going out into the ocean? Well, when we start to look at some of the sea whiffs data that gives us an idea of what's happening to currents and temperatures in the ocean, as well as primary productivity, we start to find interesting collections of data. In this case, of the 1,200 sea turtles that were accidentally captured on U.S. long lines in the Western Atlantic, you can see all these juveniles are found all along these oceanic fronts and where there are currents and temperature fronts where these different oceanic conditions are converging. These convergences are also areas where what there are lots of fish are known to be found and that's where you find also your sea turtles because what they're looking for is zooplankton and organisms that eat zooplankton such as jellyfish and I will tell you that this was not the easiest photograph to get because jellyfish become very dense and that's where you find leatherbacks getting caught in these collections of jellyfish these are all jellyfish down here that by the way is a leatherback upside down but it's a leatherback and that's also where you find millions and millions of long line hooks that are set to catch these guys, tuna, which can go for $1,500 to $10,000 a fish in the Japanese markets. Now, many of the IPFW students who've worked with me have also worked with our Fort Wayne Children's Zoo Initiative, in which we have established an education program that is used in the schools down in Costa Rica as well as in the United States. This is Chris Barlow, former graduate student here, who worked with the school's students down there and books that were donated. Notice they are in Spanish. So if you are going to donate books, please, if you do send them to me, if you want them to be used in Costa Rica, please make sure they're in Spanish. We also have lots of kids from up in this area who are going down and doing their science fair projects in Costa Rica. This is my daughter and her buddy Claire, who just did quite well in their science fair project, went down and worked in Costa Rica. And we've also established a hatchery for the purpose of producing as many hatchlings as we can every year and to protect those eggs and to protect those hatchlings and get them out to increase their numbers. So will you let the leatherback turtle go extinct? I hope not. I hope you'll get involved. I hope you're engaged. I hope that you want to participate. And I hope you want to come down and see the sunset in Costa Rica and help us do what we have to do. My time is up. Thank you very much. Yeah, how about it there, Dave? <laughs> factor and that's one of the things that we'd like to do there's a doctoral student from Drexel University who just passed his candidate exams this Friday and who hopefully will be getting out on some of these long line vessels and putting satellite telemetry devices we have a commitment from this Sloan top program for over 150 transmitters and free satellite time this next year. With that, we hope to maybe get some of those on males that are accidentally caught on some of these long line vessels out in the ocean. It's difficult to find students and or colleagues who want to go out for a month to two months to sit on a long line vessel rocking out there in the ocean 
smelling dead fish, and then occasionally finding a leatherback. Now, the fact is that there are some cruises that go out and never encounter a leatherback hooked on the long line. So you've wasted 30 to 60 days of your life hanging out with a bunch of smelly fishermen. <laughs> so the answer to your question is, we have no idea how many males there are. We certainly hope that there are out, and we suspect they are because the eggs that are being laid are fertile. And we have seen a few of them. And we actually have a National Geographic, uh, my colleague, postdoc, Rich Rayner from Australia, worked with the National Geographic folks this past year, finishing up a special that will be on in September that uh, has some uh, critter cam footage of leatherback males trying to uh, copulate with females as they come off the beach. So we have actually seen one or two of them and seen them interact, which is impressive. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, you, you partially answered it, which was, what about their mating behavior if we don't see the males too often? Are you fairly sure that since all the females go back to the same beach, that that, in fact, is where mating takes place? Or does it seem to take place out in the middle of the ocean somewhere? Most other species of search sea turtles, there is some males that will come to the nesting beaches and sit there, usually in the beginning part of the nesting season. But it's also obvious from our video work with National Geographic that males, the females reject males and are not very um, accepting of their advances and go down to the bottom and stick their tail right into the sludge on the bottom, which is the site which the male is concerned with. And um, the fact is that that we suspect that they're fairly monogamous because genetic studies also show these animals will lay eight to nine successive clutches in one season, spaced 10 days apart. So one female has a huge reproductive capacity in that she can lay up to uh, six, five, 600 eggs in one season. But all of those eggs are fertilized by the same male. If they were promiscuous and copulating with more than one male, the likelihood would be that there would be a diversity of, of male sperm fertilizing those eggs and a greater diversity in the clutches of eggs. But we don't see that. And that seems to be confirmed by the fact that the females that are at the beach and are coming out to nest should have already copulated and are not very receptive. And there may be the rare uh, novice female who maybe didn't copulate on her migration in who these guys will find and copulate with but they don't seem to stay there very long because when we used to do this work in January we very we never saw a male and I will tell you that we spent many many hours out there it's only in the early part of the season that you will see males yes Well, the mechanism is that there is a bevy of genes that probably code for all the physical features of your secondary sexual characteristics, such as the development of the, the penis in the male or, the, or the, the cloaca in the female and so on. All those are probably controlled in one operon, which is a genetic term that describes a clump of genes that usually operate together and do the same general thing. And that gene that controls that whole operon that either goes on and cascades a female production or a male is sensitive to a temperature. The production of the, of the, the turn on, the product that turns on that whole operon is sensitive to temperature. And that temperature is very narrow between a very half a, half a degree. So there are many proteins that are very temperature sensitive and will only be produced or not produced depending on the temperature. So that control will then either turn this cascade clump of genes on or it will keep it closed, preventing it from operating. And we think it's the male, uh, it's a male operon because the default sex, which is the more important sex, is females. On either side of that temperature trigger, 
you get females. And the window for the, is about a degree to a degree and a half where you produce males. The same thing is true in crocodilians, archosaurs, alligators, and crocodiles. And the way they regulate the temperature of the nest is they actually throw vegetation, which now decays, keeping the temperature of the nest fairly close to the pivotal temperature. That's the temperature that goes one way or the other. So they actually have a mechanism which allows them, and we do know that there are turtles like Myasaur, the good mother turtle, which Jack Horner, who was one of our previous speakers, used to speak about. They are known to have had these nests that were thought to be covered with vegetation in which the eggs were incubated and protected by this vegetation and probably maintained within a very narrow range of temperature which leads one to believe that this similar mechanism was in, in probably in that lineage. Dr. Farlow, do you agree? Right. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I want to invite all of you to uh, a little bit of a reception afterward, punch and cookies. Uh, but before I do that, turn you all loose, I do want to uh, make a modest presentation here. Bubble wrap. Do I get the bubble wrap? You may have the bubble wrap. I'll keep the plaque. Oh, no, let me read this. This is a, uh, a certificate of appreciation presented to Frank V. Palladino by the School of Arts and Sciences as our distinguished lecturer for April 15th, 2003. Frank, thank you very much. Lovely lecture. Thank you very much. And now, please join us for Punch and Cookies.